Thank you very much, everybody, for being here. My name is Brock Blevins, and uh, this is the Ecosystem Restoration Global Initiatives in Science and Practice webinar series. We convene monthly. If you have any questions, please, please feel free to type them into the, the chat box, and we'll address those at the end. But today, we have a guest speaker, Thomas Kay, founder and executive director for the Institute for Applied Ecology. And he's gonna to talk to us today, uh, title of the presentation. Uh, well, this is a technical guidance session for us today, and it's Diversity is Magic, Emerges, Emerging Issues in Selecting Appropriate Native Plants for Ecosystem Restoration. Okay, so just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, this is our monthly webinar series. This is the first year that we've done this. Uh, we like to provide insight and knowledge from uh, the IUCN community to restoration practitioners from around the globe. Uh, we meet uh, every third uh, Friday of every month, about 40 minutes on regional initiatives, updates, technical guidance, um, and then we have question and answers and ways to connect with our fellow enthusiasts around the globe. Uh, so this is open to all IUCN and CEM members um, and anybody who's interested in restoration, we welcome you to join. Um, the link to join every month is the same that's included in the Zoom registration confirmation for every month. So you can use that same link every month. Um, and you can find the complete webinar series um, since uh, last February uh, on our uh, YouTube page. I'll post that into the chat. Um, we also have a, a webinar series on the IUCN website. That's a little bit slower to get populated, so the YouTube channel definitely has everything you're looking for. And if you're interested in the CEM or the IUCN and you're not yet a member, please just email me and I can send the, you the instructions on how to get involved. So I won't introduce Tom too much myself. I'll let him do that best. As I mentioned before, he's executive director for the Apply Institute for Applied Ecology, and he's going to talk to us today about um, native plant seeds. So Tom, I will go ahead and mute and let you just go ahead and take it away. All right. Thank you very much for that, Brock. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, it's morning where I am. Um, I'm very happy to speak with you this morning about selecting plant materials for restoration and, and why we do that and when we're doing habitat restoration. Um, I am uh, the executive director of the Institute for Applied Ecology, which is a nonprofit organization located in Corvallis, Oregon, on the west coast of the United States. Uh, and I, I am a, a really a plant demographer by training, uh, but uh, a restorationist at heart as well. And uh, most of my background is in, in botany. Um, so I work with rare species, conservation, habitat restoration, invasive species control, etc. cetera. Uh, to this talk, uh, I'm calling Diversity is Magic, Emerging Issues in Selecting Appropriate Native Plants for Ecosystem Restoration. And the reason we're interested in this is we live on this lonely planet um, that is currently experiencing extreme impact from humans uh, and our large population through changes in land cover, invasive species, climate change, etc. Uh, Hobbes uh, in his, this paper pointed out that the um, uh, the human footprint on the globe is increasing and, and getting fairly intense in many areas of the earth. Um, because of this, habitat restoration is necessary in many habitats. Also, this uh, pressure on land uh, on the globe has resulted in many species of plants becoming threatened and endangered. In the U.S., there are nearly a thousand threatened and endangered species. That's about five percent of the U.S. plant flora. Um, and globally, the IUCN Red List uh, shows around thirteen thousand to fourteen thousand species near threatened to extinct. Again, around four percent of the world's species of plants. So this impact is tipping the scales for some species, not just reducing the cover of habitats. Um, some of this is resulting in just a decline in diversity overall. 
the plant species that cover the ground, that are the autotrophs that convert sunlight into biomass and energy for all the other organisms, um, are, are losing some of this battle. And this diversity is in decline because of climate change and, and other factors. Uh, this is one example from Damchen, Harrison, and Grace uh, that this group revisited habitats uh, in southwestern Oregon, uh, it turns out. Uh, uh, plots that were sampled in the 1950s and they went back in the early 2000s and found that regardless of the soil types, diversity had dropped very substantially in this region. And this is a region with very low human occupation, uh, some timber harvest, but otherwise a fairly wild landscape. So this brings us to seeds. And you know why seeds? Because seeds are uh, how we get diversity back into ecosystems. And that's, that's what we want to talk about today. Ecosystem service is our goal in restoration. We generally want to improve conditions on the ground for um, a lot of services we, we uh, appreciate, whether that's for wildlife or um, stormwater retention or whatever. Um, and diversity is magic. Diversity plan is uh, strongly associated with ecosystem service. And seeds are the key to restoring that diversity. Those are the themes of, of today's talk. Um, so diversity is the spice of life. Diversity is what uh, we can manipulate to restore many ecosystem functions. So in today's talk, I really want to focus on the importance of diversity for ecosystem function, the importance of native species over weeds, uh, some tools for increasing diversity, the current and emerging issues in seed selection, and then some online seed selection tools I'll review briefly. Um, so why, what does plant diversity have to do with ecosystem function? This is uh, a picture of a place called Cedar Creek where uh, researchers at University of Minnesota have been evaluating the effects of diversity on ecosystem function. And one of the important results of that research has been this uh, diversity stability hypothesis, which has been tested and found to be real. Uh, Tillman and others published this in Nature. Um, the number of species that are present uh, in a uh, community is associated with the stability of primary productivity in that community. Communities that are more diverse are more stable. And that stability is very important when we depend on biomass production. If we have high stochasticity in ecosystems, we can lose species and lose function more easily. Um, another similar kind of experiment has been performed uh, in Germany, near Jena. This is called the, Ger the Jena experiment, where the effects of diversity on ecosystem function have been tested in a different way. Uh, this group um, has associated plant diversity very strongly with all other groups in the ecosystem. In other words, all other groups of organisms either interact directly or indirectly with plants and the diversity of those plants affects all of those species or those functions. Um, this is a figure from their research and I'd like you to focus on on the top right panel here where we're talking about species richness and this shows that as plant species richness goes up so does the diversity of other species in the community. Um, this is true for pollinators, it's true for pathogens, for carnivores, uh, uh, for parasitoids. The only thing it's not true for are in invaders, which are actually negatively associated with uh, plant diversity. So using plant diversity as a way to restore ecosystems uh, really does e restore ecosystem function. In fact, it's one of the few things that is consistently associated with stronger ecosystems. So restoring diversity is one way to restore those ecosystem functions, but why, why native diversity? Why are, why are weeds or invasives not the way to go? Uh, they're out there anyway, they're producing biomass, what's the problem? Well, these data show that as 
native, uh, the, the association between native richness and exotic plant cover is negative. In other words, the more exotics you have in terms of their biomass, the, the lower diversity of natives you have. And this is true on the plot scale up here, as well as all the way down to the site scale, you know, across whole sites, the association holds stable. Another way to look at this also is that the turnover of species from site to site is higher for natives and lower for exotics. In other words, weeds homogenize plant communities both at the site and between sites. So down here, this is from site to site, the beta diversity or the species turnover is much lower for exotics than it is for natives. So there's much higher diversity of natives um, within sites and between sites, uh, but it can be negatively associated with exotics. Um, and species turnover from site to site has also been associated with ecosystem function. So the diversity of plants from location to location uh, affects bird diversity as well. Um, so how do we restore diversity? Well, with seeds. Seeding may be the only way to increase diversity in some systems. Um, this is a uh, piece of research by Eric Seebloom that shows that seed limitation is an important factor in this species of uh, sunflower family. Uh, and he showed that as the distance from a, uh, well, it showed that when you add seed, um, like here, you get more plants than if you don't add seeds, even within a meter of a patch of this plant. And as you go further out, that relationship still hold held true. And we find in our research that many systems are seed limited. Uh, there's this assumption often that if you uh, kill the weeds or otherwise restore a site, that native plants will just come back. They'll come out of the soil, they're there ready, ready to go. And you know, in a few places that may be true. Midwestern wetlands, I think, uh, show a pattern of that. However, in much of the rest of the world, seed banks have been so badly depleted uh, through land use that when we try to restore the functions to a system, um, the native plants simply don't return. Uh, we have to bring them in. And so le seed limitation is a major hurdle for us. So adding seeds is one of the best ways to add diversity. Uh, and uh, I'd like to show you some results of an experiment that we conducted a few years ago here in Western Oregon. Um, this is a place called Coyote Creek, and you can see in the middle distance uh, a plot with a grid in it, and we established uh, 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 vegetation in these plots and then manipulated uh, the site uh, with different management treatments and with seeding. Uh, this is another picture of the actual site, and you can see these uh, 15 by 15 meter uh, grids or cells in a grid, um, all dominated by grass and other forbs. This is, happens to be a wetland uh, habitat. Um, here's a close-up showing some of the uh, treatment units and some of the uh, effects. The factors that we looked at were um, burning, uh, mowing, haying, which was mowing and then removing the um, vegetative debris, and then grazing. And grazing was done with sheep over a 48-hour period. And the sheep were penned in these areas and, and grazed uh, until they reduced the stubble, um, and then they were moved to another site. This is the so-called prescription of take 20 sheep and call me in the morning. Uh, and it really does uh, mow down the plants. We also used seeding in this uh, experiment as a way to try to increase diversity. And we applied seeds at four different uh, rates from adding no diversity to up to 22 species in our seed mix uh, through each quarter of each plot. So each quarter of a plot got a different uh, seeding rate. Um, when we look at some of the results, we find that um, uh, 
burning was the actual uh, physical treatment that allowed us to increase diversity the most, but only when we added seeds. Again, the site was seed limited, and then when we added greater diversity of species, up to 22 species, um, that's when we achieved the highest increase in uh, species diversity at the site. So there was an interaction between uh, the treatment we used and the seeding rate we used in determining how much species diversity we were able to improve. Um, but burning was a technique that in this system exposed a lot of mineral soil and created uh, a very uh, good seed bed for seedling establishment. So it was only when we burned that we were able to manipulate the site uh, substantially. Um, in another experiment that we conducted uh, in the Pacific Northwest at uh, nine different locations in Oregon and Washington and Canada in prairies, we found similar kinds of results that when we seeded, um, we found that we could improve uh, species diversity um, if we burned first, uh, but if we didn't burn first, we had low uh, improvement in seed, diver seed uh, in plant diversity through seeding, some but less. Um, and what's interesting about this study is we uh, concluded this study in around 2009, uh, and then we returned to the sites um, about five to six years later and looked for treatment effects at that time. And we found that those treatment effects had faded with time. So our treatments of using herbicide or mowing or burning to manipulate the community uh, uh, had uh, lost their impact. And without further restoration, the communities had kind of converged on a similar type. With one exception, the treatment of whether we had seeded or not was residual. So we still found an increase in species diversity in seeded plots versus the non-seeded plots. So seeded plots had higher diversity than non-seeded plots, even after several years, even after the other kinds of treatments had kind of lost their impact. So seeding is, was the only technique that we had that had lasting effects on plant diversity. So now I'm gonna turn my attention to some current and emerging issues in, uh, restoration, especially through seeds. And uh, much of this has to do with seed selection and uh, where we get our plants. So one of the issues that's becoming very clear to those of us who do restoration and, and select seeds is that local adaptation is very common in native plants. Local adaptation is the uh, superiority and fitness of plants from a given location compared to plants from another location grown in that same place, sometimes called the, the home site advantage. The, uh, local adaptation is a genetic trait. Uh, it is uh, held by many species. In this particular example, uh, a very recent publication in Ecology and Evolution, uh, the researchers looked at species in the Great Basin in North America. They examined 305 studies uh, that reported variation among populations and found that 95% of those studies found uh, that there were differences among populations. So that's the precursor to local adaptation. And that's shown here, that the majority of species, even across many different life histories, um, show strong uh, variation among populations. They also found that 86% uh, out of uh, 161 uh, studies that reported trait by environment variation uh, found positive associations with the environment. In other words, species were uh, varied in their traits uh, by environmental correlates. So um, that's another indicator that local adaptation can be occurring. Now in those fewer sites, there were 24 and 10 studies that actually looked at the effect of uh, local superiority for survival and for flowering. And they found that 67% and 90% of those studies found evidence 
of local adaptation, and that's shown down here. Um, it depends on the trait you're looking at, but there's strong evidence for uh, local adaptation being very common through three different signals, whether that's among population variation, uh, trait by environment association, or actual empirical evidence of local superiority. So local adaptation is real, it's very common in plants, and if we ignore it, we may find that the non-local types will fail in restorations, uh, which is an expensive mistake to make. So one of the uh, approaches that uh, researchers have been proposing is the use of seed zones. Um, these are areas of relatively consistent environments in which plants could be moved theoretically uh, from one place to another without loss of uh, fitness. Uh, some of these areas are, uh, fair, this is for the United States that these provisional seed zones have been developed um, uh, by the uh, US Forest Service. Um, and you can see that in the southeast, there's very broad bands uh, of climate. And these are really a, a combination of ecoregions and climate that have parsed out seed zones in the eastern US like this. If you move over to the west, you find that conditions are much more um, fragmented and disjointed by more complicated geology and uh, uh, elevation gradients and soil differences. And so the, the provisional seed zones are far smaller and uh, more mixed and blended. Um, and this is one sort of approach, if you don't have genetic data, use something that some information you have about the environment of these species to uh, select some kind of reasonable area to move plants around beyond which uh, you might see failure of restorations due to local adaptation. Um, now, Havens et al. and, and Breed have talked about uh, planning for climate change and using, different, using plant materials in, in different ways. So in this study, Havens uh, showed that uh, as you um, look to the future climate of species, you can find that, say, for example, a species here might be likely to see its climate move north this far. So uh, when we're planning to use plant materials, we may need to be thinking into the future climate of what will grow at a particular place. And when we're trying to conserve a particular species, um, we may need to think about where its climate is going and potentially conduct assisted migration to move species to where their climate is uh, shifting. In the Eastern uh, US, most taxa are showing uh, climates that are shifting north or northeast. In the West, or in the United States, we're showing a lot more uh, variability in whether species are going north or south or east or west. Uh, and much of this has to do with the fact that species may go uphill as well as uh, changing latitude. Um, some of the strategies for uh, obtaining seeds in this uh, changing environment range from a strict local approach where you pick one population that is from the site that you're going to be restoring and you keep the seeds right there. Uh, that may not always be an option uh, if seeds aren't available from the site you're trying to restore. Uh, so another approach might be what they call this relaxed mixed, uh, a relaxed local where you take uh, maybe a few populations from very near your sites, even just a few miles, and you mix them to improve diversity and get them back on your site. Uh, these go up to composite mix with uh, a broader geographic area and uh, more populations, an admixture, range-wide mix, where you might have many populations blended together from throughout the range of the species. Uh, to really increase uh, genetic diversity, but uh, the local adaptation issue could become an issue. Um, and then finally, we get to predictive uh, seed sourcing, which is matching the seed source to the future climate of the area 
you're going to be restoring. Uh, and that approach uh, is uh, challenging because we need to know where, wh what the climate will be, as well as uh, matching soils and other issues uh, or their features of the environment. Um, when we talk about mixing seeds from different sources, um, some of the upsides, that's called either the single source or multiple source approach, the Psalms approaches, um, the upside of multiple sources is that you can achieve higher genetic diversity in your seeds. Um, you may have improved adaptation uh, and resilience to a site because you have many more gen gen genotypes available for a site to select from. Um, you may have lower inbreeding. Inbreeding may be a problem in some small populations uh, that are sometimes used as sources for restoration. If you only take from one population, you may be carrying over inbreeding depression. And it may reduce the pressure of seed collection on any wild, any one wild population. So if you're collecting from many populations at the same time, um, the pressure on any one is reduced. Now, one of the downsides, theoretically, of using multiple sources is the potential for outbreeding depression. And this can occur when uh, populations from very distant locations or very different habitats are mixed genetically. Their progeny can actually have lower fitness than their parents. This has not been reported for plants from locally mixed seed sources. Everything depends on what you mean by local, uh, whether that's similar uh, loca nearby locations or very similar habitat types. So pushing that envelope some reasonable degree has not resulted in any kind of outbreeding depression. On the contrary, has resulted in strong improvements in, in genetic diversity. This example over here uh, with a plant called golden paintbrush shows that uh, if you start with multiple wild populations that are different from one another genetically, and you combine them into a, a single nursery, uh, you can maintain the diversity from each population, uh, but when you harvest those seeds uh, together and put them on a restoration site, the diversity of the source populations is present in the restored populations. So this shows that you can go from uh, genetically different wild populations through a nursery and into genetically much more diverse reintroduced populations through restoration that have much higher diversity than wild populations and therefore give the wild sites, um, the new, sorry, the new restoration sites, much more genetic diversity from which to select suitably adapted plants. So uh, this admixture or uh, multiple source approach to obtaining plant seeds uh, can have some strong benefits for long-term resilience and restoration. So this study here is a, a study that uh, looks at the combination between um, genetic diversity and, and multiple uh, seed sources or what the seed source is and the context. And this, this study was more of a, a, a thought experiment uh, derived from a series of experts and then uh, with a lot of data from plant materials that were on the open market. Suitability scores were, were generated by a panel of experts. Um, and what we see here is that for a context which is for a small, disturbed, low gene flow or uh, uh, potential to a remnant uh, environment, such as a home garden in an urban landscape. The implications of using different source materials of plants differ from those in a context where we may be talking about a large and disturbed uh, area with high gene flow to other populations of the same species. In other words, a, a restored wild landscape. So these are two extremes and there's a continuum between them. However, um, what we see here is that um, 
sources of variety of different types, including, uh, say, a named cultivar with no genetic diversity, um, is suitable for uh, an urban garden, um, at least to a modest degree. Um, and uh, one even with a, a medium uh, genetic diversity and with a, a known source also can have uh, reasonable um, function in a, an urban garden, but would not have much function in a uh, wildland because of the low genetic diversity um, and the selection that has occurred for this plant for uh, its horticultural value. And then uh, when we go to uh, a seed source that has no genetic diversity, but it might be a named variety, again, it may have high function in a garden because it's been selected for some particular trait, um, but very poor function in uh, a wildland situation. And it's only those seed sources that have high genetic diversity where the source is known so the the plants can be matched to the appropriate location that has very high value for a wildland context um, it also would have high value for an urban context as well uh, so whether a species is from a mixed source it has high genetic diversity um, uh, has uh, is from a known location etc the importance of that really differs on the context of where those plants are going to be established on the ground. Um, I'd like to uh, shift over now and talk about some tools that are available for uh, selecting seeds online. Um, these are all North American and very much United States examples. So apologies to those of you from other parts of the world, but I'm hopeful that these may serve as uh, inspiration uh, for you uh, to either develop local tools or to find local tools if they have already been developed and I'm just not aware of them. These are the ones that I know about. So first off, uh, the Native Seed Network uh, that is actually run by my organization, the Institute for Applied Ecology. Uh, this is the website here. Um, uh, it is a really just a directory of native plant nurseries and producers. Uh, it has an easy user interface. Uh, so if you're looking for a particular plant and want to see if it's available to put on the ground in your area, then you can uh, use this to find a nursery that sells that species. Um, this uh, network also hosts the National Native Seed Conference. Uh, the next one of which is uh, scheduled for uh, late winter of 2021, so a little over a year away. Another online tool is one called the Ecoregional Revegetation Application, or the ERA. Um, here's its website uh, again. And this has been developed by the U.S. Federal Highway Administration. And it's based on the United States uh, Environmental Protection Agency's level three ecoregions um, and the USDA plant database. It's essentially a joining of these two uh, uh, layers and databases. And it can be a, a help if one is trying to determine what is an appropriate species list for a particular site that you want to restore. Uh, it doesn't have a high resolution, but it can tell you these are the species that are native to that area. So it's, it's quite handy for that. Another is one called uh, the seed, seed Lot Selection Tool, or sometimes the Climate Smart Seed Lot Selection Tool. Here's its website. Um, this uh, tool is very handy if you're trying to look ahead to climate. Uh, it, this was developed, excuse me, by the U.S. Forest Service and the Conservation Biology Institute. Um, and it identifies locations from which seeds may be moved to a new site to match the climate. Um, it allows you to match the current climate from the seed you're using to where you're going, as well as to forecast into the future. So if you're trying to think ahead and say, I want uh, something that will uh, grow in this area in this 
new frontier as climates change, I may need to bring in seeds from a different location and plant them here so that they have long-term resilience. So this tool allows you to do this sort of future casting for uh, where seeds need to come from in order to do well at a particular site. I find that this tool does work best when the user has some familiarity with the climate variables they think are important um, because the user has uh, a lot of control over what climate variables are selected as drivers of, uh, say, plant fitness. And if you're not familiar with what those are, you may have to try a few different scenarios yourself or do some reading. This was primarily developed for trees, but there's no reason it can't work for other kinds of plant species. Another tool is called the Seed Selector. Um, and uh, here's the website for it right here. Uh, it's at seedmapper.shinyapps.io, the seed selector. Uh, it was developed by the Colorado Plateau Native Plant Program uh, with the United States Bureau of Land Management and the U.S. Geological Services. Um, it is a tool that allows you to match the climate of the seed accession to your plant location, much like uh, what the other, the last tool I showed you, this, the, this one up here, the seed, seed, um, the seed lot selection tool does. Um, but it takes a different approach. Um, and one thing that it's uh, uh, handy for is if you have seeds already in hand from multiple locations, or you know they're for sale and you know where they're from, you can upload that location information, the, the seed accession information, as a batch. And then uh, this tool will allow you to show on a map where those seed sources will be appropriate, either now or in the future. Uh, so there's also a video tutorial for this that's very handy that sort of walks you through the whole tool. Um, uh, so you can upload the, uh, a polygon of the area you're interested in or um, uh, use these sliders for lat latitude and longitude to um, identify the area that you want to work in. Um, very nice tool. Um, neither of these tools, uh, the seed selector, a seed selection tool or the seed selector rely much on soils data or other environmental data. Um, they're primarily climate-based tools. Um, although uh, elevation can be a factor, at least in the seed selection tool that I, I've experienced, I'm not sure if that's true in the, in the other one as well. So you can adjust the elevation range and, and other things like that. So it's, it's pretty interactive and you can do a lot with these tools. Um, in summary, the, the online tools for seed selection that I brought up were the Native Seed Network, the Ecoregional Revegetation Application, uh, the Climate Smart Seed Selection Tool, and the Seed Selector. Um, I hope these have been interesting points for you. I've tried to emphasize how important diversity is for ecosystem function, and that's when we're doing habitat restoration, we need to be thinking very strongly about diversity, not just planting one tr tree species, for example, for tree cover. And that if we do uh, some restoration without seeds, we're probably not going to achieve our targeted goal of a healthy uh, ecosystem function. We need to bring in native species in high diversity to achieve that. And uh, also that uh, as the climate is changing, it's forcing us to consider where we get our seeds and how we put them on the ground. And of course, we have many tools for establishing restoration, uh, establishing seeds from restoration, but we're finding that those tools that uh, disturb the soil enough to create a seed bed are those that um, result in the highest establishment of the native plant seeds that we put down. I've reviewed for you some of the tools that are available online for selecting seeds, and I hope those are useful for you. And at this time, I'll, I'll stop and, and take questions. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, that was a great presentation. And a lot of that was I was not familiar with myself. So um, I hope that a lot of the other participants on here, of which we have about 53 joining us today, um, not quite certain from where, 
but please feel free to type into the chat any of the participants if you would like to connect with uh, other restoration researchers or practitioners from around the globe. Um, just a little bit about yourself, where you work, maybe some contact information if you want to kind of create a little bit of a community here. Um, I'm going to just close this out with two quick slides before we go to answering questions. And in the meantime, if anybody has any questions for Tom that we can address uh, before the end of the hour, please type those into the chat and we'll get to those. Um, but I just want to let everybody know about next month's session. It's going to be on global initiatives. We're going to talk in general terms about the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration, um, a little bit about the 2020 World Conservation Congress, and hopefully by then people have found out whether or not their sessions got approved, and we can talk about that, as well as um, the upcoming 2020 uh, webinar series that we're going to be holding. We have some ideas on some of the topics that we want to bring up and we'd like to hear some feedback from you as well. So um, next slide and I think it's just a, a, a general question slide. Yep there we are. Um, so please type into the chat if you have any questions and we will address those. I don't know Tom can you see the chat? Are you able uh, to find that? No, I haven't found it yet. But okay. I think that's because uh, my PowerPoint is sort of taking over my screens. Okay. Yeah, you know, feel free to minimize the PowerPoint, you know. Oh, no, I see um, it. Can yeah. you see blue on the screen? Can I see what? Uh, forget it. Um, I just see the slide. The box looks like, but I don't see anything else. Anything. Yeah. Else. Here's a so, question. Go ahead. Yeah, do you see this first one here from Graham Tuttle? Yes, I do. Yeah, feel free to answer. I'll, here, how about this? I'll, I'll, I'll verbalize it and then you can just answer back. Uh, so from Graham Tuttle, uh, he asked, does disturbing the soil to help establishment of native seeding species also lead to exotic species from the seed bank also establishing? So the, the answer is often yes. And uh, so one of the things we do find with uh, using prescribed fire as a restoration tool is that it, it vastly improves the seedling establishment of the natives we seed with. However, it also can stimulate some weeds to uh, come into the ecosystem. Much depends on what weeds are in that seed bank on the site. Um, in some places, burning could be uh, just a disaster and stimulate many more weeds to come up and uh, a herbicide approach might be actually superior. Um, of course, herbicides and burning vary in uh, their suitability for use at different sites. So using a technique that uh, reduces the cover of natives, exposes soils uh, without, in, without stimulating weeds too much is what you have to figure out for each location. Great, thank you very much for asking that question, Graham. And I'll move this on to Catherine's. Um, she wanted to know a little bit more about the methods that you've used for your to perform your controlled burns. Um, can you expand upon that a little bit? Well, yeah, the, the methods have uh, generally included uh, placing either a wet line around the area to be burned or the use of uh, some kind of fire retardant foam around the area to be burned at small scales for plots. And for much larger fields, um, often a, uh, a, a tilled uh, band of bare soil is worked around the area to be burned. And then fire crews use drip tor torches or other devices to uh, start the fire and uh, maintain uh, the fire. Usually in grasslands where we work, the fires are very quick. They take uh, from, uh, 10 to 30 minutes uh, for a fire to sweep across a field that may be uh, 20 to 60 acres. It varies depending on the fuel moisture, etc. Um, we also partner with other organizations to do controlled burns. We ourselves don't do the mark. Um, we uh, work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or other government agencies local fire departments, et cetera, to get um, burns done. Even some of the local Native American tribes uh, have excellent fire crews and know a lot about managing fire. So partnerships are really important for pulling off controlled burns. Great, thank you. Um, another one from Michael on the topic of 
urban forest restoration. Um, and he asked if the online tools don't account for the soils or other local conditions such as heat islands, what are some of the other considerations that they could think about uh, in order to make informed decisions about seed sourcing, particularly in an urban uh, restoration environment? Yeah, great question. Um, uh, I think if you've got heat islands, uh, you know, you've got an urban situation, things are so different there. You, I think you have a lot of flexibility in, in uh, what plant materials you use. One of the, one of the risks of using uh, species or genetic material from a distant location is that if they get away, they can be harmful to the wildlands. But in an urban situation, that risk is smaller, of course. Um, I would always look first for some local uh, source of seeds. Um, but one thing that seems to be true from the literature very consistently is that a local advantage or local adaptation really occurs at the scale of uh, environmental closeness, how similar sites are to one another in their environment not how geographically distant they are. So uh, choosing your seeds from a place that appears to be environmentally similar to where you're going to plant is better than just getting the closest source. And then it's not just the source of the seed you're using, but which species you choose to plant. Uh, so uh, I, I think that local knowledge about what species used to occur in an area or what natives are doing well there now um, are, you know, th those pieces are telling you they're, they're good choices. Um, but it's always better to add more diversity too. I, I wish I had a better answer for that than, than I did, but uh, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, thank you. Next one here is from Beth. Um, she's working with some solar energy developers throughout North America. She's gonna be in DC talking um, at a panel for their annual policy forum. And she just wanted to know if there's anything that, uh, if there's one thing that she could share from your um, experience uh, with all this about establishing ecological benefits over a 25 year solar energy land lease, what might that be? Yeah. If I, I, if I phrase I, that correctly. Yeah, and, and establishing or restoring vegetation in a solar array can be quite challenging because you have to work around those uh, solar panels and the structures that hold them. Uh, often they're not very high off the ground, um, two to five feet say, or you know half to uh, a meter and a half. Um, so, uh, and they're casting shade on the ground. So they're not the same, you know, that field is not the same as a grassland. However, um, establishing I would, I would think about what ecological benefits might be appropriate at the location. Um, is there wildlife around that could use it? Um, is that appropriate there? Certainly pollinators, so establishing um, a diversity of plants that flower and can be maintained regardless of the solar panels um, is, is a real opportunity and one we're, we're actually interested in as an organization as well. How can we uh, incorporate more ecosystem functions into solar panel arrays, which in many cases are just weeds or bare dirt under solar panels. So we're, we're not getting as much out of that land as we might. Um, but you know, that land is habitat, even though it has uh, solar panels over it. So I guess the message I would say is, it's habitat, treat it like habitat and manage it like habitat. Great, thank you. Um, another one from Graham. Uh, again, on uh, prescribed burnings, um, do you have any experience on prescribed burns in areas that are not particularly fire dominated? For instance, uh, in Western New York, there's some debate on whether the role of prescribed burns as a management tool, um, you'd appreciate any advice you might have. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And it, to be honest, I don't have a lot of firsthand experience uh, with controlled burns in places that didn't experience frequent burns historically. Um, but I would say that sometimes we use fire uh, in, a, in an unorthodox manner. For example, fires in the systems I work in occurred historically in the late summer and fall. But sometimes we have an opportunity for, say, a winter or a spring burn, and it has a different function. So 
I think we can look at fire as a tool and the season at which we use it or in the system in which we use it can affect the outcome. And so we need to understand how fire interacts with the vegetation um, when we use it out of its normal or its historic um, pattern and frequency. It yet may have uh, a role that can help us with management. Um, so I think it's one of the tools we want to be able to use and uh, it does have important functions even in systems that don't receive fire that time of year or uh, don't, you don't have higher fire frequency. I think uh, how you manage the burn is everything. Thank you, I have another one here from Mike Conroy. And uh, he's asking, are there any good examples that you could point to of practitioners making informed decisions on how to determine which seed sourcing strategies to utilize? So I guess case studies, examples of successes or lessons learned, um, in particular strategies such as admixture, predictive, local only, et cetera. You know, there, there's not a lot of primary literature on direct comparisons, for example, of plant materials of different um, uh, histories or sources. So say an admixture versus a selection versus a uh, wildland uh, collection from, you know, direct from populations. Um, there was a study recently um, that compared uh, the seed sources that were available commercially from seed sources that were developed uh, from wildland collections right after a burn in the Great Basin. I'm, I'll have to get back to folks with the uh, uh, authors of that. I think one of them was Francis Kilkenny. Um, but that study found that the uh, more locally sourced uh, and, and native species actually outperformed the commercially available and non-native species that had been planted for some of the ecosystem functions. But it took a couple of decades uh, of plant establishment and, and development on site for that signal to really come through. Uh, so uh, I would look up papers by Francis Gilkenny about uh, that. Um, and then I don't know of any that have said, well, let's try seeds from predictive modeling or local selections or admixtures and, and put those uh, on one site and see what's happened. I think there's a, a real need for empirical tests for this stuff. So I, I wish I had uh, more. To, if, if I had, if I knew more about studies like that, I would have put them in the doc. Yeah. Great. Um, I have another one from Catherine here. Um, when collecting native species that are only available in small quantities, um, when the intention is to restore large areas of disturbed land, in which way or ways is it most optimal to utilize them? For example, um, one, create a larger seed source at a nursery, or two, direct seed in a prime area of the reclamation environment, or three, produce robust seedlings at a nursery and outplant to the reclamation environment, uh, just as a couple different examples, or if you have other ones. Yeah, no, those are, those are great examples. Um, uh, here in Oregon, when we're doing exactly what you're talking about, we use option one. We create a uh, agricultural field from wild collected seed samples. We, we use um, multiple populations from our ecoregion. This is a fairly small ecoregion. Um, and we produce them agriculturally to increase the seed availability for restoration. Um, it's one can just go ahead and direct seed into the reclamation environments and then potentially harvest from that, but you're not as likely to get uh, a strong harvest as if you've managed it agriculturally. So you, you may not have as high a seed efficiency. And then uh, your third option of uh, you know, basically producing container plants in a nursery and then outplanting those with your, your few and, and priceless seeds I think is actually uh, a good approach as well, especially for those species that we don't seem to get strong seedling establishment in the restoration through seeding approach. <coughs> so it, it really may be uh, a, a good approach in some cases, but what we do as a general practice is we take the seeds from wildland collection and we put them into agricultural production. 
Thank you. The next question is from Terry Hogan. Uh, she asks, are you seeing restoration ecologists choosing different seed sources or species as a restoration strategy for climate change? Terry, that is an excellent question. Um, I, uh, I'm gonna switch back to the screen here and go to this slide here. Um, I have not seen folks doing what you're talking about very much. Uh, but this is an example from our research that I took out of the talk and so I had it at the end of the slides here, where we said, um, here, here's the rationale. There, there are novel ecosystems developing out there because species are coming together in new ways uh, already, and, that, and mostly due to uh, invasive species um, tumbling across the landscape. Um, in this example, what we're proposing is uh, we have data from many plots in some prairies in the Willamette Valley of Western Oregon. We can look and see which of the species uh, are in remnants that are the most frequent and most abundant species. And our hypothesis is that those species that are essentially showing resilience to climate change and resistance to weeds are the native species we should be trying to help the most because they're already showing themselves to be uh, the winners. Uh, so these species are the most frequent and abundant in uh, habitat remnants, even habitat remnants that have been invaded by invasive species. Uh, and so uh, they're, they're showing this resilience and, and resistance to change. And uh, we are, are exploring the idea of, uh, even though they don't always occur in the same community now, uh, they could be planted all together at a restoration site and create uh, kind of a novel uh, assemblage of robust natives. Um, many of them do occur together now, but uh, not always. Um, so that's sort of a, uh, a maverick approach to say, uh, let's look to these natives to see who the strongest ones are as our environments are changing for multiple reasons. Uh, and let's emphasize those in restorations because they're the winners. Um, I can't think of any uh, strong examples of people doing this now, but I think we will see that happening uh, uh, in, a, in the future, in the near future. Okay, thank you. Uh, these are all great questions. And um, I know that you have to leave right at the top of the hour. So <laughs> unless I see some more questions come in the chat box between now and the next two minutes, um, I think we can start to close this out. And Tom, um, from Kara and Mai's perspective, as well as everybody on the webinar series, I assume uh, this was a great example of a technical guidance session for our webinar series. And we really thank you for your insight. Well, thank you very much for happening. It's been my pleasure. And uh, I hope that those of you on the call still are, um, have found it useful. Um, that, that was my goal. And, uh, and I, uh, I uh, hope you have a great remainder of your day, whether it's morning or evening or somewhere in between. Great. You too. Thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I'm going to close this out. I'll shut this down in about two minutes and uh, I'll, see any, I'll send an email to everybody that attended. Um, I just want to ask Tom, is it okay if I include your contact email in the 50 people that showed up in case they yes, have any follow-ups? That is absolutely fine. Uh, okay. I'm happy to uh, correspond with anyone. Great, great. And I look forward to checking out some of the tools that you, you pointed out. Those are those look very resourceful. So, so and, thank you uh, very much. Thank you, Brock. Will these uh, slides be posted along with the video so that the, the web links that I pointed out for the seed sourcing tools are available? Yeah, so um, please send me um, your slides, like your final version of the slides, and I'm going to turn that into a PDF. And I'm going to include that in a thank you email to everybody that attended. All right, we'll do it. I will make a video of this and it'll be available on our YouTube channel. Um, and I'll include a link to that entire playlist as well once I post that in about a week. Um, and then for anybody who didn't jump on here today, um, I will post that eventually on our thematic groups um, IUCN website. However, as I mentioned before, it takes a little bit longer for that to get populated. Um, so uh, in time, but definitely the video will be available. All right. Thank you, Brock, and thank you, everyone.
Yeah. All right. Well, everybody have a nice rest of your day and we'd love to talk further about uh, everything in 2020 with you in December. Thank you. Have a good day, Tom. Thanks. Thanks, Brock.